been talking about um, my best friend, and we've been talking about the char- some of the characteristics of God, um, and uh, you know, the Bible says that we see in part, and uh, we prophesy in part. So what we are doing is just describing different attributes of God, and we started off just talking about that God is good, just a simple attribute of God that God is good and that He is only good, that He is completely good, that there is nothing but goodness in who He is, and that everything that God has created, God looked for that attribute in His creation. So when He looked at everything that He created, He looked and He saw it is good, and He created you because He is good. And in you, he looks to see, does what I've created have my attribute of goodness? And when he looked at you, he said, it is very, very good. And then last week, we saw that um, a part of God's goodness is that he is a provider, that God provides, that he is your shepherd, that he has named himself Jehovah Jireh, your provider, the one who sees and provides. If you woke up this morning... God has provided because he's a good, good father. So just you sitting here this morning, breathing, shows that God is a good provider. The Bible says that he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust because God is good. Everything that God does is because he is a good father. You see, and religion and this world system is continually going after the character of God. Well, if, he's, if God is so good, then why? And we describe all atrocities in, that are happening around the earth. Like God is the source of that. It's like, well, we bring in the question, well, if God is good, then why does this happen? And why does that happen? Never, ever taking responsibility for our own decisions as, as the human race. And that we are responsible for the decisions we make. We are responsible for our own lives. Hello? Just like Adam and Eve, we are always looking to blame. We are always one, no, no, it's not my fault, it's this. See, and that is what the spirit of iniquity is. The spirit of iniquity is like, listen, we will be right in our own eyes. And that is exactly what Adam and Eve decided, that we will be right in our own eyes because they believed the lie. Instead of believing the truth of what God had said, that I'm a good father and that I've created you to bless you so that you and I can enjoy fellowship and love one with another. But then they looked at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and decided to decide for their own lives what will be good and evil. And since then, there has been this character assassination about God. Saying, well, if God is, then why? Never ever taking responsibility for our own decisions. I want to read in um, Genesis or Deuteronomy from 32, verses 3 to 4. This is Moses proclaiming about how good God is. It says, For I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Is he. Now, if I believe in the bottom of my heart that God is pure, that God is just, that God is righteous, when I begin to believe his word concerning my identity and his, his character, all of a sudden a lot of things start to make sense. But if my heart is not persuaded concerning God's goodness and what he accomplished through his son Jesus by dealing with the spirit of iniquity. Now iniquity comes from a Hebrew word inequity. Inequity. Or what is, what is equity? Let me put it that way. A value. We want to equate things by a sense of value or a sense of fairness, a sense of what is right, a sense of justice. And that's why Moses here, he's talking about that God is just. The word just means God is fair. In everything that God does, he is fair. Now, in this world system, we have a different understanding of what we believe fairness is. We want to equate fairness by our own limited understanding, and we have formed our own opinions about what fairness is. Now, let me explain in terms of the gospel what fairness is in the light of who God is. So, 
let's describe it this way. Well, let me put it this way. How many of you have seen in the United States, they have the picture of the, uh, the courthouse, of the woman who is blindfolded, holding the, the scales in her hand? And underneath the, the one side, it says justice. So justice means fairness. So when God is talking about the fact that he is just, he's talking about his fairness and his faithfulness. So in our limited understanding, we will say, if you go to the courthouse, you have a prosecutor and you have an attorney. If somebody is being prosecuted for something. And the prosecuting attorney will bring all the evidence as to why the person is guilty and the defending attorney, attorney brings all the evidence showing that he is innocent. And the judge who is going to be impartial and fair will make a judgment or a decision based on the evidence that has been presented. You with me? Now in the light of the kingdom and who God is, if God is fair and just, in our limited understandings we will say, God, why did this happen? Where's your fairness? Where's your justice in this when describing normally it's an atrocity or something bad that has happened? It's like, God, you're unfair. And we begin to judge God based on our limited understanding of fairness. But with regards to God's justice and his fairness, it's not a case of God taking some of your good things that you've done and some of your bad things that, he, that you've done and then weighing them up to see how he's going to treat you based on his fairness. Now, if you want to relate it to God's standard of what he expects, he's not going to be balancing your good deeds and your bad deeds to determine how good or kind he's going to be to you or whether he's going to try and do something bad to you, which he doesn't do, by the way. No. God puts them both in the same thing. And then he weighs them against himself. That's how high his standard is. So it's like taking 800 million tons on this side and you weigh a feather on this side to see, well, now, is it going to be equitable? Does the value measure up? Is it fair? 800 trillion tons of who God is and you as a feather to try and measure up. And we'll say, no, but I was, I'm much better than I was last year. We'll add a feather. <laughs> yeah, but I don't swear as much as I did five years ago. We'll add another feather. See, you are never, ever going to measure up to God's standard of justice, of righteousness, of holiness, of who He is. You are never, ever going to be good enough. Your good deeds will never ever outweigh your bad deeds to where you can measure up to God's requirement. The balance will always be out of kilter. So how does God in his fairness, where he can relate to you and I, where we can experience his life, where we can experience his provision, where we can experience his love, where we can be equal with him, how does he rectify the balance scale? Because you, with all your good deeds and your bad deeds, are over here. And God is here. The only way that he can rectify the balance scale, where things will be fair, is if God himself has to come onto this scale and bring them into equal value. So he gives his son, Jesus, who is God. And he says, I'm going to live in you. And because I live in you, now things are equitable. Now there is peace between you and I. Now you can receive all of who I am and all the promises of who I am because I live in you. See, we are so often, we want to be qualified through our good deeds and our works when God's saying, you're qualified because of my son. See, and that is what equates to the fairness of God. God has been unfair to himself because he died so that you might live. That's, if you want to describe God's fairness, he was the one who took the punishment for your sin, took all of the judgment, took all of the righteous requirements of God's standard upon himself, died for you 
so that you can live and experience all that He has for you. Yet we want to question whether God is fair. God is fair. He's been unfair to himself. But he's so fair to you. And he's so fair to me. Because he does not treat you and I based on what we deserve. He treats you and I based on what he did to, to his son Jesus. And Jesus did it willingly. God wasn't an abusive father who was abusing his son. Jesus gave himself willingly so that the scales could be fair. And he did an injustice to himself so that you could experience his love without bounds. Isn't that good news? See, and, and this is why when I begin to believe the truth of the gospel, of what God has done in his son Jesus, that I can believe in my heart that God is good to me, not based on whether I've been good or not. When I'm believing in my heart that, Lord, you are good and you do good. So anything and everything that comes from you that is good is from you. Anything that is not good is not from you. And you can make a clear distinction and decision in your heart, and it produces trust in you, because it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. Repentance doesn't mean that I need to get my life right. See, and that's what we think. We think re repentance is, I need to repent of my sins. That's what we think repentance is, thinking that because I'm now repenting from my sins, God is going to do something. No, God did something 2,000 years ago. And it's when I believe the truth. Repentance means to change my mind. That's why the Bible says that when one person repents, changes, it, changes their mind about God, and sees His goodness, all of heaven rejoices. Because in their hearts, they are believing the truth that God is good, and that He's only good, and that unreservedly, I'm making a decision in my heart to believe that God is a good Father, only good, and that His ways are perfect, and that He is just, and that He is true, and that He is faithful. That is who He is. And as I begin to get my heart persuaded of that, guess what happens? I begin to experience it. Because I'm believing in the, the truth of who God is as a good God. And remember, God isn't partial in anything. Everything that God does is He's completely it. So when He says He's good, He's completely good. He's only good. When He says He will provide, that's because He's describing that's who I am. That's what I do because I'm good. See, the, the thing is, we begin to judge and accuse God and find Him guilty because things aren't going our way on earth. And normally they're not going our way because we are not heeding biblical wisdom. Because we don't believe the gospel. And God works in and through your heart by based on what do you believe. What Believe means to be persuaded of something. What are you persuaded of? See, if you, per, if you are negative and you don't believe, you're just going to get negativity and you're not going to get what you think you are wanting. And this whole series started because I wanted to talk about faith. But I can't believe in or have faith in somebody if I don't believe they're good to me. Faith is not a wishing well. And that's what I'm going to call that series. What is a wishing well? We take a coin, we flip it over our shoulder. Well, I just wish. And that's what, our, what we think faith is. Well, I threw it up to the Lord. I'm just waiting for him to do it. That's not faith. Faith is when I'm persuaded. I'm persuaded that he's done it. See, the Old Testament was always looking towards something. The New Testament, we are looking back at what has happened. And my job, my responsibility as a believer is to get my heart persuaded of what he has already done, what he has already given me, who he is. See, God wanted to deal with the provision issue and the healing issue and the security issue and the love issue so that he could have a relationship with you. He's like, okay, what do you guys need? Right, I'm going to do everything and I'm going to give you everything that you need so you never have to stress about it so that you and I can have a relationship without reserve. 
where you and I can enjoy each other's company without you thinking, I wonder if God's going to hurt me. I wonder if he's going to be the source of my pain. I wonder if he's going to let me down. I wonder if he's, he's going to not provide for me. God's like, listen, I'm, let me deal with all those issues so that you and I can enjoy one another. But what do we do? We accuse God. We judge him. They did this. The Israelites did this. Read this in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Now, we read, we read that. We read it like God was being tested. God was testing them and God was trying them. No. Read what it says. Who tested who? It says, my fathers, the people of Israel, tested God, and they tried God. They put him on trial, the one Bible says. This wasn't God testing or trying anybody. This was the people of Israel who were busy putting God on trial, and they were testing God the whole time. Yet, what was God's desire for them? I'm going to deliver you from slavery. I'm going to take you through the, the wilderness, which is only going to take six days. And you're going to enter into your promised land because that is my plan and my purpose for you. Yet the whole time they tested and they put God on trial. Continue. You can read it throughout the Exodus. God, why are you doing this to us? It's like doing what? I'm taking you to the promised land. It would have been better for us just to stay in Egypt and to die there than to die in the desert. And this is why God's heart, he was like, goodness gracious, guys, your hearts are so hard toward me. My desire is to bring you deliverance and freedom, to take you from slavery into sonship, where you can enjoy the promised land that I have for you, and your hearts are so hardened toward me. You won't even believe that I'm good toward you. And it goes on, it says, Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. What was God's desire? That they enter into rest. What is Jesus and his promise to you and I? That you might enter into rest where you are ceasing from your works, where you are trusting and relying on a good father who is working on your behalf. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Notice how God describes unbelief. He says an unbelieving heart is a, an evil heart because you don't trust me. You don't believe that I'm as good as I say I am in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, he calls a hardened heart, an unbelieving heart, a heart of sin. The word sin there means to miss the mark. See, don't, see again, when we think of sin, we think of all these major things. The root of sin, hamatia, the Greek word, means to miss the mark. Like you are aiming at a target and you miss the target. See, we miss God because we don't believe that he's good. We don't believe that he's a good father. We don't believe that what Jesus Christ actually did in reconciling you to himself was a completed work. So we can't trust him. And God's exhortation, why he keeps on giving us good news, is to get our hearts persuaded where we can exalt Jesus for all that he has done. And we can begin to see God for who he really is, as a good father who loves you unconditionally. The psalmist says there, he says, I will rejoice and magnify the Lord for his loving kindness and his truth. I rejoice him because of his love and because he speaks the truth. I will praise you, Lord, for your love and your faithfulness truth, your loving kindness. So, God is faithful. The word faithful, I'm going to read it out the dictionary. Faithful means having or showing true and constant support or loyalty. So, God will always be true to you and show you constant support and loyalty. It is deserving trust. It means keeping your promises or doing what you are supposed to do. So when God describes himself as being faithful or the faithful one, and we'll get to that scripture to show you, that's how Jesus describes himself. I am the one who is called faithful. 
which means he will never let you down. In the dictionary, faithful also means not having sex with someone who is not your wife, husband, girlfriend, or boyfriend. Okay? For those of you who needed that one. Faithful means to be full of faith. It means steadfast in affection and allegiance. That God is faithful, which means he is steadfast in his affection toward you and his allegiance toward you. It means firm in adherence to promises. Given with strong assurance. It means to be binding. So when God says that he is faithful toward you, he's saying, listen, I am bound toward you. Doesn't he say that in Hebrews 13, 8? He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Ever. He is bound to you. In Hebrews 11, 11, it says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. She had, the word judge means to make a decision. So anytime you read the word judge or judgment in your Bible, the reference is to a judge looking at the facts, making a decision. So Sarah, in her heart, looked at her body and said, I'm 100 years old. It is impossible to have a child, but I make a judgment. I make a decision based on a promise that God gave me. And God, all that I have to hang on, I can't look at my body. I can't even look at my husband. He's older than me. But I've got a promise. I've got a promise. And God has promised me I'm going to have a child. And the Bible says she judged him faithful who had promised. And she conceived. See, God has given you a promise for every need that you have. He has given you a promise. And instead of finding or judging him as being unfaithful, we need to be like Sarah and judge him faithful that what he has promised is true for me. Instead of being wishy-washy and coming up with all sorts of reasons why it won't happen. In Revelation 3 verses 13 and 14, it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. This is Jesus. So Jesus is describing himself. Jesus says, I am the Amen. What does Amen mean? So be it. Amen means it is done. So Jesus describes himself. I am the one. I am the amen. So amen is an affirmation. So that's why I try and get you guys to shout at me and say amen. Just so that I know you're not too fast asleep and that you're affirming something. So when you say amen, it's an affirmation of something. It's an affirmation of what has been said and done. Jesus describes himself as the amen, as the one who has done it for you, where he says, so be it, it is done. And then he says, I am faithful and true. He describes himself. That is who I am. I am faithful. I am bound to you. If I promise you something, I will do it. Because that is who I am. And you know that God has exalted his word even above his name. So if his name is faithful and true, his word, the Bible says, he is exalted even above that. So if you find a promise in his word, he said, that promise is yours. Because if it's in my word, I'm faithful and committed to seeing that come to pass. Revelations 19, 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war on your behalf. But he who sits on that white horse, he describes himself, I am faithful. I am faithful. You know, people will let you down. Life will let you down. Stuff will happen. Life isn't fair. But I want to tell you this morning, there is somebody who has named himself faithful, and he has bound himself to you. In 2 Timothy, Paul writing to Timothy, he says, 
it is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, for some people, because, again, we have this misunderstanding of God, and even the translators got it wrong here. The word deny, if you can go back to verse 11. We're trying a new computer program, so it's a little bit slow. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, and we di- the Bible says that we have died with him, and we have been raised together with him in newness of life. So he's saying, listen, we are, we live with him now. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, the word deny there is the Greek word. I'm going to read it for you. I only know a little Greek, and he owns the cafe down the road there. (laughs) It's the word oniomai, which means to contradict. So let's read it with the correct English word there. If We contradict him. He also will contradict us. So when I contradict him, because remember, Jesus is truth. So if I contradict him by saying he won't provide, he will contradict me by saying I will provide because I cannot be but faithful to you and I cannot contradict myself. So if you come and you say, it won't happen, God will, that's contradicting him, and God will come and contradict you and say, no, it will happen. Why? Because I, even if you are unfaithful, I cannot contradict myself, and I have to be faithful to you. In 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 3, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation, temptation means testing, to be tried, to be scrutinized, to experience an evil day. No temptation, trial, scrutinization, evil day has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. He's saying every person on this planet experiences trials, tribulations, where their life is under pressure where they are experiencing a hard time. It is common to everybody. So no matter what pressures you might be experiencing, it is not God putting it on you. It is part of living in a fallen world. Everybody goes through stuff because stuff happens. Stuff that you didn't plan for. Hello? And God is faithful. Not God is guilty or God is to blame. Hello? And God is faithful. And he will not allow you to experience a testing, a trial, or any kind of hardship that is experienced on this planet beyond what you are able. Why? Because he lives in you. And with this testing or trial, whatever you're experiencing in life, He will provide the way of escape for you. Where there are others who don't know him won't find their way of escape because they don't know and believe that God is faithful. But because you believe in your heart, God is faithful. So no matter what life throws at me, I can have a confidence in my heart that God is good because I know he didn't lead me into this trial. What did Jesus pray? Lead us from temptation. That's our prayer. The Father's our Father. Lead us from temptation, testing, trial, hardships. So if you're experiencing it, you run to God's faithfulness. You run to his word. You run and you rest in the finished work of Jesus. That Listen, I don't know how we're going to get out of this, but one thing I know, God is faithful. Listen, God has been faithful to you. God got you that job you wanted. God got got you that house you wanted. God got you that spouse you wanted. He gave you that child. He gave you that job. He gave you that car. He gave you all of those things. God has been faithful to you. 
And we need to remember and recognize that He is faithful. Even when we've been faithless, even when we've wanted to give up, God has stayed true and faithful to you. You need to remind yourselves, God is faithful. Ek gaan in Afrikaans lees. Hou vast. Ek gaan probeer. Hier kom het ding. Hebreers. 10. 23 tot 25. Hoe vorder ek? Laat ons stijf vast hou aan die hoop wat ons belei. Want God is getrouw. Want God is getrouw. Dit is een lekker Afrikaanse woord. God is getrouw. God is faithful. Hy doen wat hy beloof het. Laat ons ook na mekaar omsien, dier mekaar aan te spoor tot liefde en goeie dade. Ons moet nie van die samenkomste van die gemeente af wegblij, soos partijse gewoonte is nie, maar mekaar eerder aanmoedig om daarheen te gaan. En dit des te meer, na mate jylle die oordeelstag sien na dit kom. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. That is why church is good for us. Because we stimulate one another to love and to do good deeds. As is the, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing, drawing near. God is faithful. God is faithful. Say it after me. God is faithful. Listen, life might throw you a curveball. You might be in the middle of a curveball. I want to encourage you this morning. God is faithful. He will not leave you hanging. He hasn't left you. He never leaves you nor forsakes you. And you can take the promises of his word and you can believe them because he who promised is faithful. As you begin to get your heart persuaded of his goodness towards you, that he's a good father and that what he has said in his word is true for you, you'll begin to see it happen because your heart governs your life. And let us not be like the Israelites who put God on trial because stuff hasn't happened the way we expected it to happen. But let's rather put our confidence and trust in a faithful God who cannot contradict himself, who remains faithful to us, even when we are faithless. Won't you stand to your feet? I'm just sensing in my heart at the moment that the Spirit of God is, is dealing with a lot of hearts this morning. And maybe you have put God on trial because of life, because life has happened. And you've said, Lord, why have you allowed this or done this? And I want to let you know this morning, God isn't the one who is the author of any pain, discomfort, pleasure, trial, testing. He didn't lead you into a desert. He's leading you to a promised land. And will you let him go and make a judgment like Sarah, who did not consider her own body and did not consider the circumstances relating to the promise that looked impossible, but rather considered in her heart and made a judgment and decision in her heart that God has given me a promise and I consider him who promised as being faithful, as being faithful. So I'm going to ask you, will you close your eyes, please? If God is stirring in your heart, it's a, it's a time to respond. Repentance, remember, means change your mind. So if you've made a judgment about God that you realize is incorrect, this is an opportunity for you to repent and change your mind and believe that God is as good as He says He is, that His ways are just, that He is true, and that He is faithful towards you. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter how faithless you've been. God remains faithful.
If that is you, just repent. Repent. Change your mind. Say, Lord, I'm sorry, man. I judged you incorrectly. I formed an opinion about you which is not true. But this morning, Lord, I want to believe that you are a good God, that you're a good Father. And I open my heart up to trust in you as someone who is faithful toward me, even when I've been faithless. I thank you, Father, that I can magnify your name in loving kindness and truth, that I can love on you because you remain true and you love me. And that you're faithful to me. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. One day the Bible says that you're going to meet him, the one who is sitting on a white horse who describes himself as the, the great I amen, the great I am, the one who is faithful and true. Are you prepared to meet him? Are you ready this morning? Are you coming to him based on your end of the scale where you're coming to him with a feather? Or are you willing to receive him, receive Jesus, and say, Lord, I'm asking you, to equalize the scales. You can only do that by believing in Jesus. You can't come to God based on your own merit. You come to him based on Jesus and receiving the gift of Christ and saying, Lord, I'm following you. If that is you this morning, and you say, I want to receive Jesus, I want to pray for you. So if that is you, just slip up your hand, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Open the door of your heart and let Jesus come in so that you can be equal with him in the sense of his righteousness. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the gift of your son, for your goodness toward me. I believe in you that you died for me and that you rose again. Thank you for saving me and making me whole. Father, I just thank you for every person this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you that as you deal with our hearts concerning trusting you, I thank you, Father, that you continually persuade us of your goodness, your kindness, your faithfulness, the truth of your word, that your promises are true toward us, Lord. And that you are faithful to your promises because you cannot be anybody but yourself. And that you are the faithful and true one. That we can love and acknowledge you, Lord, for who you really are, Lord. I thank you that you expand our hearts. Stretch our hearts to believe in your goodness. To believe in your goodness. That what you've promised is true. We ask that in Jesus Jesus, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like somebody to pray with you, please come to the front here. If you put up your hand this morning to receive Jesus, I have a free gift for you. I have a book called What Now? And it will give you a whole bunch of information of the experience that has just happened internally where you become a, a new creation. So if that is you, you put up your hand, please come to me afterwards and I want to give you this book put it into your hands. Amen. You're highly favored and deeply loved of God. Have a great week.